Have you heard the line, we can only do so much through the budget reconciliation process? This is Washington speak. This is the budget reconciliation process. They agreed some time ago. It may have been the uh, Budget Act of 1974, but whenever it is, it doesn't matter. That when it comes to getting a budget done and reconciling the differences between the House and the Senate bills and so forth, that that would be immune from the filibuster rule in the Senate. It's called the budget reconciliation process. I don't pretend to be an expert, but I do know this. I know how the Constitution works. When uh, Paul Ryan was on here many years ago, maybe we'll pull this up for next, next week, Mr. Producer. When he was on here many years ago, he said to me about 85% of Obamacare could be repealed through the budget reconciliation process. I have repeated that time and time and time again. 85%, that's a big deal. We'll take it, right? Now apparently, big chunks of it cannot be. So somebody's changed their opinions. Somebody's changed their opinions, despite the fact the Supreme Court in King versus Burwell, as my buddy Chip Roy writes in The Federalist, um, the court ruled about the intertwining, essentially, of these regulations, and that they're inseparable from the rest of the law. Now these regulations, these are the killers. These are the, these are the cost drivers. These regulations. And their budgetary impact is significant. So to say that these regulations do not come within the budget reconciliation process is absurd. Now who decides if they come within the budget reconciliation process or not? Who decides? The parliamentarian of the Senate. I want to read this to you. It's a piece at the Federalist website by my buddy Chip Roy. Chip Roy uh, worked for Governor Perry for a t- period of time. He worked for the he worked for uh, Senator Ted Cruz as chief of staff for a period of time. He's an extraordinarily bright man and a friend of mine. And here's what he says: I like the Senate parliamentarian very much and consider her a friend from my time in the Senate. I prayed for her when she had a family loss. She prayed for me when I was sick with cancer. She's a good public servant. But she's neither elected nor the final word on the future of health care for Americans. What she offers is her view on the Senate rules. At the end of the day, the Senate decides the Senate rules. Let me repeat that. The Senate decides the Senate rules. In this instance, both the parliamentarian and the Senate can and should find that full repeal of Obamacare through the budget reconciliation process, and thus 51 votes, is permissible. Republican leadership has long been saying that if full repeal is sent from the House to the Senate, it will be deemed to violate Senate rules under budget reconciliation. They claim this is because the insurance regulations and mandates are merely incidental to the budgetary impact of Obamacare, and therefore would draw a budget point of order requiring 60 votes to fully repeal the law's insurance regulations and mandates. This is false. Obamacare's onerous insurance regulations and mandates are the primary drivers of individuals and families rising premiums and deductibles. They are the very backbone of Obamacare's oppressive centralization of health care. The regulations and mandates are crippling the health insurance market, driving up costs for patients, doctors and insurers, and degrading the quality of care that patients are receiving. To argue that their budgetary impact is merely incidental to the rest of the law is absurd on its face. Even the Obama administration made this very argument before the Supreme Court in the case of King versus Burwell, arguing forcibly that the regulations are inseparable from the rest of the law. Predicated on that alone, Congress has a case that full repeal through budget reconciliation is viable. Yet, neither the House nor the Senate have even attempted to pass a full repeal of the law through reconciliation. Let me repeat that. They won't even attempt it. The Senate parliamentarian hasn't even adjudicated whether she believes a full repeal is allowed under reconciliation rules. After eight years of promising to fully repeal Obamacare, 
Congress has not even tried to do so in a process requiring just 51 votes in the Senate. Also, should the parliamentarian present an unfavorable ruling, the Senate has the power, as Senator Ted Cruz articulated, to put Vice President Mike Pence in the chair and overrule the parliamentarian. The Senate decides the Senate rules. Congress has promised to fully repeal this catastrophic law for nearly eight years. Now that they control all levers of power, they're hiding behind excuses and procedural theory to avoid making good on their promises. Congressional leaders are putting the hypothetical opinion of an unelected Senate employee above the promises they made to the American people about the preservation of America's crumbling health care system and above the quality of their constituents' health care all as an excuse to avoid taking a consequential vote and doing the right thing for all Americans. They are out of excuses to finally make good on their promise to fully repeal the catastrophic Obamacare. And the American people are out of patience. So let's recap this so even the New York Times can comprehend it. Even the Associated Press, what's the guy's name? Jonathan Lemire, or Lemire, L-E-M-I-R-E. Try and take down my words accurately if you're going to repeat them, Mr. Reporter. And it's this. Number one, we don't even know what the parliamentarian is actually going to do because nobody's presented it to her in the form of an actual bill yet. Number two, how can it be that cost-driving regulations, the heart and soul of, what's being, of what is destroying the financial heart of this Obamacare, is considered other than budgetary? Number three, in the end, it's the Senate that makes the Senate rules, not a parliamentarian. It's the Senate and the vice president sitting in the chair. Now, I'll add a number four. I'll add a number four. There's nothing in the Constitution that creates a filibuster rule. As a matter of fact, early on in the Senate, there was no filibuster rule. They adopted it somewhat later. And it looks nothing today like it did back then. And they've adjusted the filibuster rule in the past. Harry Reid himself and the Democrats, as you know, through the so-called nuclear option, called the Reid option, uh, they blocked the filibuster rule, the use of the filibuster, when it came to appointees within the Obama administration, as well as the lower courts, the district and the circuit courts. They let it stand when it comes to the Supreme Court. So the filibuster rule... Uh, has been adjusted. It has not always existed. And it seems to me the Constitution comes first. So why wouldn't the Republicans want to try this? I'll tell you why. I'm convinced there are so many moderates and liberals among them who want these major aspects of Obamacare to stay. Whether it's kids... Young adults, I should say, staying on their parents' insurance to the age of 26, or the, or the massive expansion of Medicaid, which a majority of the governors have embraced, or whatever it is. They don't want to abolish those things. So here's what I think. I don't think they have 51 votes in the Senate to repeal Obamacare. I don't think all the Republicans in the Senate would vote to repeal Obamacare. So they keep bringing up this, this parliamentarian and the filibuster rule, the 60 votes, so as not to expose the Susan Collinses and the Lisa Murkowskis and the rest of them, who in fact would not vote to abolish Obamacare. I think that's what's going on. We have a relative handful of more liberal members of the Republican caucus, if you will, who are gumming up the entire works. <laughs> 